Yeah. I love that. Every time I watch that, I get the chills because he still, still. got the whole world in his yeah. hands. Amen. You know, um, the title of tonight's sermon is called Trial by Fire. And we're going to be looking at Daniel chapter 3. And I don't need to tell you that right now we are all walking through some very trying times. Um, every single one of us in this room has been affected by the COVID virus, right? Absolutely. Some of you have lost your jobs. Some of you have had family members or friends who have gotten sick by it. You have lost family members who have been sick by it. Um, we have infected at the grocery store. Have you checked out the cost of your groceries the last few times you've gone? Prices have skyrocketed. Um, we've all had to alter the way we do life. Uh, masks have become a fashion statement, um, right? I mean, if Nancy's got a matching mask for her outfit today. Um, some people are speculating on the end of days that Jesus is coming, and we know that he is, but I don't know that that's today, but it could be. Um, I'm not going to tackle that topic. I just mentioned it because that is where we're at. That's where we are in these times. Um, you know, we've got division with an upcoming election, and... Thank goodness it's almost here, right? Uh, I don't know about you, but I'm up the ass. <laughs> we could all say that we're walking through a fire, couldn't we? Yes. yes. But we can live in the confidence of knowing that God still has the whole world in his hands. So the question we've been asking ourselves through this whole series is what is the best way to react to circumstances that create anxiety, fear, worry, or stress? Right? We've been asking that every, 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 every week. So today we're going to look at a story that illustrates how to respond to this question. And really, this is one of my favorite stories from the Bible. It is so cool. No, it's hot. It's cool. Uh. It's awesome. Um, we're going to talk about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know who they are. If you've read the story, you know who they are. These are three of the young men who were taken into captivity in Babylon. And they were brought into the house of King Nebuchadnezzar, and they were being trained to work for him and be in his service. If there was anyone that would could crumble or have the right or, uh, I don't know, the, I guess the right to crumble under these circumstances, it would be three, these three guys. They've lost everything. You know, everything they called normal, their home, uh, their family, and they've been taken to a strange land and put into a strange house. And, and even though they're pretty well taken care of, they still are struggling. And the thing that we need to see the most is that in spite of their circumstances, they hold on to their belief, even when life is uncertain and God is not. Hallelujah. Bless you. He still has the whole world in his hands. <laughs> So let's recap our story a little bit, just so those of you who haven't been here the last couple of weeks, we'll catch you up. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego have been taken from their home in Babylon, and they're in captivity. Um, while they're there, they're taken to the home of King Nebuchadnezzar, and he is a, a pretty brutal king. Um, and one of the things that he likes to do when he does this is, is he looks for the cream of the crop. He takes those that are the smartest, the wealthiest, the best trained, and he takes them for his own. He puts them in his household, and he trains them up to be in his service. So he does this, and they are taken to, to I don't know about you, but if you were moms back a few years ago, and you had the veggie tails in your house, you keep saying this name, you want to call it Nebby K. King Nebby K. Because um, that's what the veggie tails. <laughs> that's what keeps coming in my head. Um, so they're in the house of King Debbie K, and they are taken care of. They're given the finest food, and they refuse that fine food because it's been sacrificed to idols, and they know that that is breaking one of God's laws, and they request to be given just veggies and water, and they prosper. They do well on their veggies and water, and they earn a new respect from all the people in the household. So... Um, at the end of last week, Kathy has talked to us about how we should pray until peace comes. And she talked to us about how they were required to answer a question, but she didn't tell us the question. So um, I encourage you to go back and read what the question was, because it's a good one. 
But at the end of that, we see that these men are promoted. Daniel is promoted to a, a governor of Babylon. He's like one of the big cheeses next to the king. And because of that, he requests that his friends are promoted as well. So these four Hebrew boys who are being trained and groomed in the Babylonian way have now been put up as le in leadership. That is only something God can do. Yeah. You know, um, really? <laughs> so he now has this group of Hebrew people that he has taken from their homeland, and he's got a bit of a problem. Their belief system is different. They are not Babylonians, and they don't believe the Babylonian way. So how on earth is he going to create some unity? He needs to find some unity within these people. So what he does is what we're going to talk about today. He gets this great idea that he needs to build this object of worship. So it'll be a common place for people to, to worship. And he builds this statue of himself. Well, he doesn't do it. He has his artisans do it. This statue is huge. Al, you're a tall guy, but you would look like a midget next to the statue. This statue, the, the scripture tells us, is 60 cubits high and 9 cubits wide. And you're like, what's a cubit? I said the same thing. So the equivalent of that is 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide. We all look like little ants next to that thing. So uh, this thing is built out of gold. Um, so it's this huge golden statue. You know that's got to cost a lot of money. It's a very valuable statue. And um, he, he decides he wants to have this dedication ceremony. So he calls all of his leaders from all over. And when I say all leaders, I mean every single one of them. From the tiniest little person up to the top, they all had to come. And just in case the pressure, the peer pressure wasn't enough just to be there and, and hear the music playing and all this stuff, they were ordered to bow down to this statue when the music played. So he had all of his musicians come and play this pomp and circumstance thing. Now, what are you going to do when you see all of your friends bowing down to this statue? Peer pressure might happen, right? Like, oh, like just kind of like when we come into a room and you see one person's got a mask on, you quickly put your mask on, you know, because you, you want to come, you want to conform, right? Well, what do you think they're going to do? Everyone else is going to bow down. Well, this is where we come in. This is where we come in. To make it even more of a big deal, he puts on a little caveat at the end of that. Those who fail to comply are to be thrown alive into a blazing hot fiery furnace. In other words, worship or die. So this creates a pretty serious pro problem for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, doesn't it? Because their God says, worship no other God before me, and don't bow down to any graven images. Well, what are they going to do? This is where we find our question. The what is the best way to react to circumstances that create anxiety, fear, worry, or stress? Well, they give us a great example. Here they are in this situation that they have absolutely no control over. This circumstance is far beyond them. They have no control. But they are worshipers of the one true God. And they know that to worship anything other than God is to disobey his commands and to dishonor him. Yet to refuse means that they are going to be burned alive. Can you feel the tension? They are in a horrible, horrible circumstance that none of us would ever want to encounter. So, while all the music is playing and everyone else is racing to see who can bow down the fastest, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stand firm. They boldly stand for their God. They do not bow. So, what happens? Nebuchadnezzar is angry, and scripture tells us, furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Okay, so this is a rhetorical question. He knows it's true. They've been outed. 
This is one of those questions that, you know, you come home, your mom comes home from work and she says, did you clean your room while I was at work today? And you obviously did because it's a disaster. It's that kind of a question, you know. He's just trying to make a point. He has been thoroughly embarrassed in front of all of his leaders because these are three of his top in command. Um, and he's got to do something about that, right? So what he is really saying is that this isn't really what I want to do, but you have forced my hand. He doesn't, what, he, what he's missing is that this God is not the one true God that the Hebrews are wor worshiping. He doesn't get that for them, it is a bad thing. He doesn't get that God has promised to never leave us or forsake us. Yeah. He doesn't get it. So this is the next part of it. He says, but if you do not worship, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Wait a minute. I missed this. Oh. Hold on. Hold on. I got ahead of myself. <laughs> he gives them a second chance. He gives them a second chance because he doesn't want to do this. So he says, now when you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you'll be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Well, here he is. I don't want to do this, boys. I like you. You're good men, but you forced my hand. This is the deal. So, he says, if you don't worship it, you'll be flown and thrown into a blazing furnace. I don't know about you, but I think I'd be a little bit scared, you know? If you build a fire at the fireplace, you know that it's going to be hot, and you make sure that you've got your grate shut, and that the sparks don't fly on the carpet because it will burn, and, you know, um, we even have gloves next to our fireplace that are the heat-proof ones so that we don't burn ourselves when we're rearranging the wood. They're getting ready to be, to be tossed into a furnace that is hot. <laughs> yeah, I hot. Even know, I even know that because they sort of work in a crematorium. So. Oh, okay, there you go. I can understand. So let's see how they <laughs> respond to this rhetorical question. So it says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. Oh my. Do you see what they're saying? It's remarkable. They are demonstrating their great faith in their God. If we're thrown into the furnace, that's okay, because our God will save us. And if he doesn't, he's still my God. He's still my God. Our God is able to deliver our God is able. For you and I to serve, our God is able. That's what they're saying. The God you and I serve, our God is able. Our God is able. This is the foundational principle that gave these men the courage to stand true to God. It gave them the courage to stand for their God in spite of their circumstances. Remember where they came from. They've been taken away from everything, but they stood. They've been held captive. They've been removed from the place they called home. In spite of being trained to think like a Babylonian, in spite of being faced with a fiery furnace, they stood for their God. Do you know and believe deep down in your soul that your God is able? Amen. Do you know it deep enough to stand for your God when circumstances are beyond hard? Look at the courage and dedication of these men. There was no doubt for them. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Our God is able, but even if he's not, we will not worship your God. This is our reminder. We have to remember that God can rescue us. Amen. These young men have aligned themselves with the one true God, and they've aligned themselves with the hard part. They've aligned themselves with that but statement. Even if he does not, we will not serve your gods. My devotion to God is based on who he is and not what he does. That's what they're saying. My 
devotion to God is based on what he does, what he, that, getting tongue tied, sorry, getting excited. My devotion to God is based on who he is, not on what he does. Have you aligned yourself with the but statement there? Even though I will stand, even though I will not worship your gods. That's the but statement. But even if. In these tough times that we're in, uh, it makes all the difference in the world if we have more than just a head knowledge of this fact. We can all know it in our head, but has that knowledge dropped that 18 inches to your heart? Even if a God doesn't rescue us from our circumstances, he is still God. Our devotion to him has to be because of who he is and not what he does. God is God. He is, and we are not. When our focal point is on deliverance only, then the only acceptable outcome to us is deliverance. Does that make sense? What's wrong with that thinking? Well, it's limiting our joy. Think about it. When we focus on deliverance, we only limit what, we limit what God can teach us. We become outcome focused to the point that we look for the resolution, but we can't really celebrate the joy. What these three men are teaching us that is in spite of the experience, they're looking for the joy. In spite of maybe burning in the fire, they're going to serve their God anyway. We can experience joy and the certainty that God is with us and he will fulfill his plan in our lives no matter what. Yes. So let's look at what happens next. Nebuchadnezzar is furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And his attitude towards them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them in the blazing furnace. He's mad. He is so angry that he orders this fire to be so hot that it is beyond measure. It is hot enough to instantly kill. See, if he left the fire at a lower temperature, it would have been a torturous death. They would have felt it. They would have burned. Their lungs would have burned. They would have filled with smoke. It would have been torturous. This fire was designed for instant death. Can you imagine what's going through their heads? I just can't even, I just, I can't. You know, that just is whew, way out there. They have been through some really, really difficult things up to this point. They have, um, well, I don't need to recap. We've got, they've been through a lot. And now they're seeing the prospect of a very painful end. The soldiers come, they bind them, and they take them to the fire and they throw them in. They are ready for the pain and suffering, but there is no pain. Their lungs are not burning. Their clothes are not burning. They don't feel any different than they did before they were thrown in the fire. And their bonds, those ropes that they were tied with, they're gone. Then they realize that they can walk around in the furnace. Woo! And this next part is amazing because they have a divine encounter with Almighty God. Scripture says, Then King Nebuchadnezzar leapt to his feet in amazement and asked his, adv his advisors, Weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? And they replied, Certainly, your majesty. He said, Look, I see four men walking in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Ooh. Ooh. Oh, I'm on fire. Well, <laughs> They are not alone in the fire. Oh, no, no, no. God promises he will never leave us or forsake us, and yes. he will not leave you alone in the fire. Amen. There's a fourth man in the fire with them. Yes. Who is this man that can cheat death and walk in the fire? So the technical term for this, this event is called a theophany, and that means there's an appearance of Jesus. In the old, it's an Old Testament appearance of Jesus. And we see this happen several times in the Old Testament. We see this as a foreshadowing of Jesus. Woohoo! This is a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ. And, but of course, King Nebuchadnezzar would know that. He would know that. So 
what we look at as a, a miss at all cost event to them is a to God is a don't miss this event. Yeah. You know, um, what appears to us as a miss at all cost event to God is a can't miss event. Do you get it? Do you get this? Dodging the fiery furnace event would have meant that they missed out on the greatest moment of their lives. They could have chose the easy route and just bowed down to the image, but instead they made the right choice to honor God no matter the circumstance. That's hard. That's hard, friends. This, you know, let's be honest here. How many of us would or could make this choice? Sometimes it's just easier to avoid the fire. Um, maybe, you know, hide your head and maybe it'll go away. Um, there is real danger in this. There's real danger in trying to avoid the fire all the time because the focus becomes fire avoidance, doesn't it? Fire avoidance is when we ask, God, deliver me from this painful experience or God, I don't like this, this discomfort. Would you please just take it yeah. from me? Yeah. Or, God, this season is really full of uncertainty. Could you please just make life normal again and smooth? It would really be a cool thing. Please make life pleasant again. Yeah. Remove those obstacles because I'm just scared. That is trying to avoid the fire. We risk missing out on our miraculous God moment. Um, I was listening to a pastor who described it like this. Imagine God has a calendar. And on this calendar, whatever date they had, he had for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, it says on that date, Sh meet Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the furnace. If they chose to go the easy route and just bow down, they would have missed it. They would have missed their date with God. <sighs> just imagine, their greatest life-challenging, miraculous adventure and encounter with God would have been missed. It was dependent upon that decision. Their understanding uh, that they could be certain that God would work in them and through them was based on their willingness to face the biggest obstacle of their life, the fiery furnace. Yes, yes, yes. So what does this mean for us? It means that we have a choice to make. And I have a challenge for you. And it's a dangerous one and it's a scary one. But I'm going to ask you to ask God. Give me an opportunity to meet with you, even if it's in the fire. Mm. Don't miss this prayer. Doesn't mean you have to like it. Because, you know, God does ask us to do things that make us uncomfortable, and we really don't like it. But it's worth it. And this is prayer isn't natural. It's not natural to ask God to give you hard stuff, right? It's a dangerous prayer. We've gotten comfortable looking for ways to avoid the fire. Following Jesus isn't always easy, and he didn't say it would be. He said, in this life you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Oh. Jesus calls us to follow him to the ends of the earth. And we see through the scriptures that there were men and women that did this. They, they served radically. They radically gave. They radically suffered, and they were persecuted. But he also promised that he would never leave them. Hebrews 3, 5, and 6, 5, 13, 5, and 6 say, Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we can say with confidence, The Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? He promises to meet us in the fire. Whatever that fire is, because these men chose the furnace, they changed the future of the kingdom they lived in. Uh, let's see what that happens. Nebuchadnezzar says, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own. 
Therefore, I decree, get this, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble, for no other God can save in this Whoa. way. Woo! What? Their courage to stand in the face of opposition change the future of Babylon because they were obedient to God. Amen. Imagine how your obedience to God can change you and the world around you when you allow God to meet you in the fire. Will you take up the challenge? Will you ask God to meet you in the fire? Let's pray. Father God, you are awesome. You are amazing. Uh, you just blow our minds on a regular basis. And God, I just thank you so much for your powerful word. Yes. God, we thank you for your promise that says you will never leave us or forsake us, that you will meet us in the fire. God, there are many of us today that are walking through a fire, and they need you. They need you to, to be with them and to know without a shadow of doubt, that you are walking right next to them and that you're carrying them through. God, we thank you. We praise you for the knowledge that you are doing that exact thing. God, we love you so much, and we thank you, and we give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So before I leave you, I want to remind you that God does his best work in the biggest disruptions and in the worst times of uncertainty. We don't grow when we're on the mountaintop. We grow when we're in the valleys. Amen. Now, before